avoiding the term standard Russian uh, because standard Russian is something that's uh, fossilized and is usually about 50 years behind the language that's actually spoken in the homeland. So even if we assume that there are differences between standard that's in textbooks and the language that people hear in the streets in Moscow or Sverdlovsk or any other city, um, we know that the Russian language spoken by the diasporic populations is different from the language of the homeland. And once we see that there are differences, our job is to describe and understand those differences. And if once, once that's done, we can better understand what are the needs of those diasporic speakers. And once we know those needs, we can develop better pedagogical tools which can help us teach those people. I'll start with an example from English. So if you look at this part of a car, um, in American English, we call it hood. In British English, it's called bonnet. And so these two terms are equally acceptable. And it's kind of silly to ask the question, which of these terms is correct? They're both correct. So hood is correct when you're speaking in the States, bonnet is correct when you're speaking in the UK. If you're a British speaker living in America, if you say bonnet and people don't understand you, you can always explain what you mean. If you're an American going to the United Kingdom and something breaks in your car and you wanna say, I need to look under the hood, they wouldn't understand you. But again, you can explain that. And so even if we do not know the actual terms, the crucial thing is that one and the same thing can be called differently. And if we want someone to be a very good speaker of English, an educated speaker of English, we need to tell them what the differences are. In an ideal world, someone would know both words and will know how to use them. So how does that translate into the Russian scenario, the language that many of you experience in the classroom and I experience in my lab when I study those speakers? I want to start by giving you an example of this language. So we're going to listen to um, an audio clip, and then once we've listened to it, we'll discuss it a little bit. Um, он зречил, mm -hmm. и он а, берет эту шапку и убегает, потому что он хочет зайца а, вытащить из шапки и слушать его. Но оказывается, что ну, шапка как бы а, волшебная, mm -hmm. и он как не может зайца вытащить из шапки, а только длинную-длинную веревку вытаскивает. А, и потом у него так... Uh, Okay, I'm going to stop here and give you a little bit of a transcription in Cyrillic uh, where we show where this person is making pauses and um, what he's, he actually says. So this is um, someone talking about the video clip from the Russian cartoon Nupogadzi, which we often use in uh, studying heritage speakers. And what you can see is that this person doesn't sound um, like a speaker in the homeland, but he also sounds different from a second language speaker because he has much richer vocabulary. So he knows words like Valshebne, or he knows the word Vitashit, and he's using the aspect correctly. Um, so. On the one hand, there are a lot of pauses, a lot of hesitations. The pronunciation is not perfect. The intonation is extremely flat. It's very monotonous. And you have those very long stops and pauses, which are happening because this person is looking for words. And this is something that I will be coming back in this presentation quite a bit. But on the other hand, it's kind of remarkable how much he manages to say 
in the um, little amount of time that he has. So what we saw in this clip and in many other clips that I'm sure you're familiar with is that speakers like that give us very short segments. It's hard for them to produce a long sentence. There are a lot of pauses, including really unexpected breaks, the breaks where native speakers don't usually break. There are errors in morphology, so there's clearly some impoverishment in morphology. Another thing we see a lot in these speakers is a lot of repetition. It's almost like they need to remind themselves and remind us what they're talking about. Uh, there are very few complex structures. That's what linguists call embedded clauses. So the sentences are just joined together. So instead of saying something like, he thinks that um, he can find the bunny rabbit, he says, he thinks, pause, he'll find the bunny rabbit. There are a lot of um, and thens, which sound like e, i, potom, i, vot in Russian, uh, something that we see a lot in child language and also in uneducated speech. So this is a very common way of helping oneself as you're building a narrative. So uh, these people have a special name and before let's say the 1990s these people were, were called incomplete learners, semi-speakers, and attriters. None of these terms is very attractive and so fairly recently about 20 five years ago, we started using the term heritage speakers. The term itself comes from Canada and was introduced by Professor Cummins, uh, first in relation to Native American languages, so-called First Nation languages of Canada. But since then, it's become very common. And basically, heritage speaker is someone who grew up hearing a language, but not necessarily speaking it. So just someone who grows up with one parent speaking that language, or a grandma speaking that language, or a nanny speaking that particular language. Someone who is a grown up can understand that language and can perhaps speak it to some degree, but who is much more comfortable in another language, the dominant language of their society. So that's your typical heritage speaker. So the qualifications are it's a bilingual, it's someone who is not balanced, who is much more proficient in the dominant language of the society. And it's also a group of speakers where we see a lot of variation from people who are fairly proficient to people who can barely say, I love you, grandma, which is essentially what they need the language for. And um, so if we talk about um, heritage language, it's um, a language that someone is exposed to during childhood, usually in the home, and they don't learn it the exact same way as that we learn a monolingual first language, because for a monolingual first language, no matter what your education is, you get to a certain level, whereas with these speakers, there is a stop somewhere in the way. Uh, the learning is interrupted by a switch to a different dominant language, and the dominant language is the language of the society, whereas the language that our speakers are, is, are exposed to is called the baseline. And I want to stop on the notion of the baseline for a second, because the notion of the baseline is not necessarily the same as the standard language. So we can't expect our heritage speakers to know standard Russian because they never went to school. And by the time uh, they arrive in a classroom, they're usually young adults or college students, and so um, there are expectations geared to their age, but those expectations are, are unrealistic because they never went to elementary school in Russia. Likewise, um, what they hear as children is not the language in the homeland, but it's the language of their parents, the language of the first generation of immigrants, which in, in and of itself also undergoes certain changes. So the notion of the baseline is actually quite complex, but one of the take home points for today is that it's really important not to equate the baseline with the standard language. Um, people have tried to translate heritage language into Russian. There are a couple of translations. Everybody's upset about each of these terms, so I don't think there's any consensus. So there have been proposals to call it семейный язык, домашний язык, and then наследный язык, второй родной, which is completely incorrect because it's their first language. It's not their second language. Then um, Irina Dubinin and I made an attempt to create an abbreviation, Luri, Ludis, Unasledvanum Ruskim Yuzukom. We liked it, but nobody else did. 
And then people talk a lot about nasledniki, just basically translation from heritage. Uh, there's also a very common term, heritajniki, um, which may not sound excellent in Russian, but it's extremely popular. So honestly, it doesn't matter what we call them, uh, as long as we all understand that we're talking about the same phenomenon, and that is, these are people who learned Russian as children, who switched to English as their dominant language probably around the age five, at the age of socialization. Uh, before that, English may have been present, <coughs> excuse me, for simultaneous bilinguals or may have been um, introduced around age three for sequential bilinguals. But so Russian is their home language and this is now their weaker language. So there are a couple of um, urban legends about heritage languages and these are the things that I wanna talk about today and um, basically trying to dispel some of the myths. So the first myth is it's not a real language. Um, the second myth is that they actually forgot the real language. Uh, the third myth is almost the <clears throat> opposite of the first one. They don't speak right, but they understand everything. And the fourth idea that you hear a lot is that they better speak English or German because they're essentially murdering the language of Pushkin. And there's nothing that we can do to make them any better. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, in the presentation today, I want to uh, look at these mm, mythologies and give some arguments against all of them. So you often hear native speakers, not necessarily educators, but just innocent native speakers say that heritage speakers do not speak a real language. I often see when I talk about heritage languages that the reaction is very, is the reaction is that of great unhappiness because people say oh, it's really terrible of these people to forget their home language. Then, as I said, the third myth is they speak what they speak, but they understand everything. And they better stay speaking the dominant language of their society because they're murdering the language of Lao Tzu, Pushkin, Cervantes, Aristophanes. I'm giving these names here big to illustrate uh, the notion that this approach is not just specific to Russian. Everybody who deals with heritage speakers coming from a particular standard language is very upset by that, and we shouldn't be. So let's revisit these comments. Um, as I said, there is this idea that what they speak is not a real language, but I want to show you that <clears throat> what they speak is a real language. It's just, it's different from the language that we're used to. The second myth is they better stay speaking English because they're murdering the language of Pushkin. And although the clip that you heard is definitely far away from the language of Pushkin, uh, the point is that these people can learn the language of Pushkin very, very efficiently. Um, and um, going back to the uncultured component, how terrible and uncultured is of them to forget their language. Uh, the point is they didn't forget anything. They're just aspects of language that they never learned. And those are the aspects that come from reading and education. And so we just cannot expect them to know those aspects because they never had any exposure to the formal education. So let me stop at this point and see if there are any questions. And once we are over that, I will start with the mythology. And it may take some time for people to type in their questions. So um, we'll, just, we'll just wait a little bit. Okay. All right. Probably no questions at this point, so let's continue. Okay, so we're gonna look at the first and second myth together, and then I will stop again to see if there are any questions, and then we'll look at the four, uh, the two other myths. So uh, the first myth was what they speak is not a real language, and the second myth is they're forgetting their language. <clears throat> so when people say they don't speak Russian, they speak something else, the idea is that they have some kind of a set of ruins in their head. It's basically not a language, but a random collection of um, language chunks and pieces, something they learned as children, you know, even some rhymes, but it's not a complete language system. That's a very common perception. Um, I often hear, oh, these people just remember phrases, they don't know any rules, <coughs> they don't know 
um, how language works. And um, that's incorrect. What they speak is a language. It's a language system, so it's not a system of runes. And they make errors, but they make those errors very, very systematically. So I'm going to show you one example of the locative plural in ach, uh, which seems to emerge as a generalized prepositional case in heritage Russian. And the other thing I'm going to show you has to do with the neuter feminine reanalysis. So we all know that Russian has very complicated case systems, and of course it's very hard for an L2 learners. Um, and um, what we find is that our heritage speakers um, use a lot of um, errors, but again, as I said, they use them systematically. So for example, when they count, uh, they don't know how to use the special form with the numerals two, three, and four, and so they say, just say dvo, dvye babrov, mnogo cigaret. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so let's look at this ah. Uh, so what we find in Heritage Russian are things like sasiedoch instead of sasiedem, zdruziach instead of zdruziami, and it's not... Um, uh, it's not limited just to American Russian. We find the same in Israeli Russian, Pet Mavshech. Mavshech is the Hebrew word for computer. So what you can see is that they took the Hebrew word, made it into a heritage Russian word, and then put this ah ending on it. As Olimach, uh, with the people who repatriated to Israel, again, a Hebrew word with the Russian ah, with the wrong, wrong in our perception. Mm. Uh, endings, the sabachkach, bispadarkach, dla farshulach for driving school. So I purposely put a lot of borrowed words here because I want you to see that they're not just using a German or a Hebrew word in their language, they're incorporating it into their language and then putting a particular ending on it. So what happens here? They don't know the right case, but what they know is that a preposition has to come with a particular. Um, non-direct form. In other words, it cannot come with a nominative. And what they're doing is they're putting this ah on everything. And this error is extremely systematic throughout Russian. We also find it in Russian dialects, in those speakers who have never had any exposure to anything but Russian. So in Russian dialects, we'll find things like bisapagah, zadevkah. And we also find it in the language of monolingual children learning Russian, which uh, which is where we find things like siablichkach, biskanfetkach. And again, these are people who didn't have any exposure to another language. So there is something about this special form, ah, which makes it extremely strong, extremely desirable to a speaker who is uh, dealing with Russian in order to use it with prepositions. Um, why this particular form and nothing else? First of all, it's very salient, it's easy to hear. So if I say Bashmachkah, Druziach, it's often end stressed. And so what you have is um, a very salient form. Um, there are other forms which are very salient, like the instrumental form ending in Ami, Bashmachkami, Sapagami, Druziami, but the form in Ah is much more common. And so our heritage speakers hear it a lot in their input. And uh, that makes it also extremely salient to them. And then finally, it doesn't show any variation as compared to, to the Russian forms of genitive, where we have three different endings, Garadov, Dvere, Denik. So you have to know that it's Garadov and not Garade, Dvere and not Dver, Denik and not Dingov. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so this form, ah, uh, takes over and essentially becomes this general prepositional case that our heritage speakers are using. They're also um, repeating the pattern from child language and the pattern from dialect. And so a good way to think about this overuse of ah is to turn the tables and to think of standard Russian or the homeland Russian as a language which complicated the situation, maybe in an unnatu unnaturally or unnecessary way, and so you want to ask yourselves not why these people are using ah so much, but why is it that homeland Russian or baseline Russian requires different forms of um, oblique cases. <coughs> the next example I want to show you is another example of systematic change, which shows that these people are dealing with a language system and not just doing something randomly. So in um, Heritage Russian, a lot of neuter nouns 
become feminine. So here the speakers say, моя полотенце, какая яблоко, большая облако. Um, something that sounds completely wrong to a native speaker because native speaker will say, моё полотенце, какое яблоко, большое облако. Um, we find this same exact pattern in non-standard dialects of Russian. Again, people who are not exposed to any other language. So we have something like, снять гумну, uh, какая строение. And we find the same in child language. So we see things like, дай мне яичку instead of them each. So again, there is something about neuter which makes it a little difficult or more challenging to a speaker who hasn't had a lot of education, a lot of exposure. And what heritage speakers are doing is the exact same pattern as we see in various other Russian variants, which is again an indication that we're dealing with a system. We notice that neuter changes to feminine, but we don't see any changes the other way around. We never find any feminine nouns becoming neuter. And that's an indication that we're dealing with a systematic rule-based change rather than just some random chunk, this little um, ruin in the head of a speaker. Uh, we also find that feminines which end in the soft consonant, things like tetrat, sol, kravat, always change to masculine. So heritage speakers, dialect speakers, and children often say kakoi tetrat, moi sol. But again, we don't see any change the, the other way around. So every time you have a change in one direction, linguists take that to indicate that there is a systematic rule-based process that we're dealing with. And then our job as professionals is to tell what exactly is happening. So why do we see this change? Why do we see this particular direction? Uh, neuter nouns are much less common than feminine nouns. Uh, Russian uh, nouns have about 45% of feminines and about 8 to 12% of neuters. So of course heritage speakers will be <clears throat> more likely to assimilate the less common nouns to the more common ones. <coughs> In addition, uh, the native speaker knows how to manipulate gender based on cases. So if a native speaker sees a noun which ends in a vowel without stress, like yablaka, um, the way to tell what the gender is, they will look at the genitive case. So if you look at yablaka, you get yablaka, net yablaka. If you look at grusha, you get net grushi. And so these uh, genders um, are seen in the genitive. But here the speakers do not really connect gender and declension. And so for them, the rule is different. If a noun ends in a vowel without stress, it's feminine. So they say maya mama and maya yabaka. And what we also find is that heritage speakers who are less fluent, less proficient, typically have two genders. The nouns ending in a vowel are all maya, and nouns ending in a consonant are all muy. Whereas more fluent heritage speakers typically have three genders, so they keep the neuter, but their neuter is now limited only to those nouns where the stress is at the end. So they will say mayo akno, mayo malako, but they still say maya palatians and maya yablaka, which is an indication that again, <clears throat> the change is going in the same direction as we see in less proficient heritage speakers, but it's not as complete as it is in uh, the less proficient heritage speakers. <coughs> now that I brought up proficiency, I want to talk about some basic generalizations that we have. Everybody who has experienced heritage speakers can say that there is a lot of variation across them. And there's another thing that when people talk about heritage speakers, especially people like me who work on them, uh, on the, the languages with large numbers, I always say, well, heritage speakers do that, and then I hear, oh, well, but I know so-and-so, and she doesn't make any of your mistakes. That really doesn't matter, because if I look at 100 heritage speakers, and there are three exceptions, <clears throat> that doesn't overturn the generalization. But nevertheless, we do this, see this significant variation, and we find fuzzy boundaries between heritage speakers and true bilingual. And we typically uh, arrange them on this kind of production range scale from less fluent to more fluent. Um, we go by biographical data, at which age did they start learning the other language? 
how much they went to school. This is something that Olga Kagan, I'm sure, is going to talk about next week. And whether or not they've been separated from the speech community. So if we have a heritage speaker of Russian living in New York, they have ample opportunities um, to hear Russian on an almost daily basis, even if they're not living in the family. But if you have a heritage speaker of Russian living somewhere in North Dakota, where they're the only person, then there is a much stronger separation from the speech community. Um, so when we look at the production range, we'll look at how much they can produce before they make a pause, how much they deviate from the baseline, how much do they repeat something that I mentioned when we're looking at the uh, audio clip from Nupugadzi. How long do they pause? How long do they think about the next word? Which words do they know? And so using all these criteria, <clears throat> we want to try to effectively classify heritage speakers in terms of their linguistic knowledge. One of the ways uh, linguists do that is looking at their speech rate, how many words per minute they produce. And the generalization seems to be that the more words per minute they can say, the more fluent they are. So I'm going to show you some data from um, monolingual Russian and English speakers and then heritage speakers. So what you see here is that an average English speaker gives you 140 words per minute. An average Russian speaker, monolingual Russian speaker, gives about 120 words per minute. Russian words are longer, so it's obvious that there will be a smaller number than in English. And then you see that heritage speakers, if we average across a very large number of heritage speakers, they're almost like half at the fluency of a native speaker. But if we now divide them into the ones who know more words, who produce <clears throat> better segments, if we look at their biography, we can also separate them into low proficiency, mid proficiency, and high proficiency speakers. And we see that there is a difference in terms of how many words per minute they produce. They're generally, slower than native speakers. However, they're not as bad as, let's say, low proficiency speakers. <clears throat> so low proficiency speakers, the ones who are really, really weak, are usually at 30% of um, normal speech rate. And the main reason for that is that they don't remember words. So what um, this fancy term means, lexical access, is that they have to pause thinking of the next word they're going to say. And so the difficulty in lexical knowledge leads to uh, the lower speech rate. What's important is that we also find that speech rate significantly correlates with some other measures of grammatical proficiency. I mentioned a few moments ago that there are two types of heritage speakers, those who have three genders, the more fluent one, ones, and those who have two genders, the less fluent one. And what we found was that there is a very nice correlation between people with two genders and people with three genders and the speech rate. So this is um, a chart which shows this neuter feminine assimilation. So basically we have people here who say mayo akno or maya akno. And what you have is that the native controls are about 120 words per minute. Uh, those heritage speakers who still say mayo akno, who have three genders, although limited to words like akno and not like not the words like yablaka, they're at about 98 words per minute. And then finally, people who only have two genders now, who assimilated their neuter to the feminine, are much slower. So again, I'm showing you these data because this indicates that um, there is a strong correlation between the knowledge of one part of the language and the use and knowledge of another part of the language, which is again a sign that we're dealing with a system. It's just that the system is not the system that we're used to. And finally, here's another very nice correlation which shows that there is a very strong connection between how many words our speakers know, we measure that by asking them to name a set of pictures, and how well they do grammatical agreements. So how well they say Zayats прибежал, uh, собачка прибежала, as opposed to собачка прибежал, and so on. This is the area where they make a lot of errors. And what you see is this almost straight line, which means that the more words they know, the fewer mistakes they're going to make in um, grammatical agreement. And the fewer words they know, 
the worse their agreement is going to be. So we, we again see a correlation between parts of the uh, linguistic system. So we find in general that lexical proficiency, the knowledge of words, strongly correlates with grammatical proficiency. And because of that, the knowledge of words is a very good preliminary measure of a heritage speaker's proficiency. So typically, heritage speakers may know only about 30% of the basic words that the native speaker knows, and some good ones know somewhere between 70 and 90. And the speech rate, in turn, is a very good global measure of proficiency as well. So uh, all this was um, to show that different aspects of linguistic knowledge and ling linguistic usage are correlated, and that would be unexpected if we had just a grammar based on chunks. I also want to stop for a second and talk about the interference from the dominant language. I assume that a lot of people who are listening to me now are in the United States where the interfering language is English. But we also know a fair amount about Russian spoken in Germany and Russian spoken in Israel. And I've shown you a couple of examples with ah, which come from um, German Russian, Israeli Russian, and American Russian. They're all the same. And more generally, we find that the interference from the dominant language is actually smaller than we expect, and that's why we see so many similarities across heritage Russian as spoken in different countries. So if we go back to the mythology, uh, we talked about how these people have a system, and I want to go to the second myth, and that is the myth that these people do not remember their language, that it's terribly uncultured of them to forget their language. What I would like to say is that uh, they did not forget it. There are just certain aspects of language that they never learned, for example, different genitive forms or some neuter nouns, because very early on in their system, they assimilated those forms to something else. Instead of genitive forms, they started using forms in ah. Instead of uh, neuter nouns like yablaka, they started treating them as feminine. And so it's not like they knew that yablaka was neuter and forgot it. It's that they always thought that yablaka was feminine. So what they speak is a real language, which has systematic rules and a very strong correlation between what their grammar is and what they know. And they didn't forget the language because they're just aspects of language they never learned. So if we go back to our first myth mythology, the first myth was it's not a real language. I hope that I've been able to show you some evidence that it is a real language. It's just different from what we use. And that they didn't forget the real language. They just learned and developed a different language. Now I want to look at the third myth, and that is that they don't speak right. <clears throat> they say, maya palatienza, but they understand everything. And then this, our fourth myth is that they better stay speaking English or German because they're murdering other languages. So let me stop before I look at myths three and four and see if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. um, and while, um, while the participants are typing in their questions, let me, um, let me ask you some questions that came in um, um, after we closed that uh, opportunity and you started speaking. So. Um, there is a question about classification, which maybe was already answered, but I'll ask it anyway. So mm -hmm. Julia is wondering, are there any classification of different levels of heritage speakers? And you already answered that, but she continues with the question saying, I work with children mm -hmm. who read and speak Russian with no problems, but were born in the U.S. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, well, it uh, depends on the age of the children. Typically... Uh, when we do all those, uh, when we approach all these classifications, we look at adults. Uh, children are normally still in the medium, in the family. And so there are quite a few areas where children actually do better than adults because the adults had a fair amount of time of separation from their familial language. Um, and there is a whole body of literature, um, including some of my own work, which I can um, send to Irina, uh, where we look at the differences between child language learners and adults. So for children, um, people typically use child-specific measures such as MacArthur or um, uh, Peabody, and uh, there is no special classification for heritage speaker children. The general observation is that 
a heritage bilingual child, a bilingual child is about one year behind in their language development compared to a monolingual child. So if you take a five-year-old speaking Russian and German, they will be roughly like a four-year-old uh, Russian speaker growing up in um, St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. um, then there are a couple more questions about um, uh, classification and the nature of heritage speakers. Um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the registration name. Jal Jaltinka is wondering, uh, what about students who went to Saturday or Sunday schools? Would you still consider them heritage language speakers? And she also says, I have students who are third generation and those who, co who completed elementary school in Russia, all in my class were heritage learners. Can we yeah. consider all of them as such? Well, that's, that's a very hard mix. So um, when we talk about heritage speakers, we always say that it's someone who grew up in, a, uh, in an immigrant setting, and therefore we don't separate for a second or subsequent generation. So for us, what matters is that it's not the first generation. So it could be first or, oh, excuse me, second or third or fourth. And there are groups of old believers in um, the Pacific Northwest and Alaska and in California who are like fifth generation, they still speak some Russian. So for that, we don't really make any distinction. If you go back to the definition, you can see that it's someone who grew up hearing Russian. Now, uh, with people who went to school in Russia, let's say elementary school, and then they came here, uh, they're a separate group. They're so-called early second language speakers. Uh, there are a number of features that they share with heritage speakers, but they usually have a slightly uh, better literacy. And um, uh, we generally try to put them in separate groups. And what we see is essentially a continuum uh, between monolingual speakers, heritage speakers who pattern with monolinguals in a number of properties, including prosody and pronunciation. Um, then early second language learners who do not show as much interference from um, the second language because they've developed very good bilingualism and then late second language learners. So it's, I can't really make any suggestions as to what to do in the classroom when you have all these people, but I would certainly encourage um, everybody to treat those who went to school in Russia and moved to a different country at let's say age seven, 10, differently from those who were born in this country. Uh, with regard to Sunday schools, um, those generally don't have a lot of effect. Uh, they seem to have a very positive effect on the parents. The parents feel like they're doing something useful. Um, but uh, there are a lot of, mm, well, I don't want to speak for every Sunday school. I'm sure there are excellent Sunday schools and they create some kind of a motivation for learning the language, but the exposure is very small. The children are in that school for just a few hours a week. When the teacher turns um, his or her back to them, they immediately start speaking English or German. So it's not like they're trying to speak Russian uh, very consciously. So there's a little bit of an um, element of motivation there, but not much of a linguistic input. Uh, there was a very nice study in Los Angeles where they compared Korean Sunday schools with um, uh, bilingual Korean English immersion programs in uh, the Korean, in, in, the, in the LA Unified um, School District. And they found the children <clears throat> who went to a bilingual school did very well, whereas children who went to Sunday school did not show a lot of Korean. And so my suspicion is that for Russian, we're going to get this general pattern as well. I also hear from a lot of my heritage speakers that they really didn't like being in a Sunday school when they were, let's say, 10, 12. Um, and that's understandable because that's something they have to do in the evening or really on a Sunday when everybody else is playing. So that builds some resentment. And it's possible that the desired effect may actually be canceled by this resentment. So I would handle Sunday schools with care. Um, there are a couple more questions, let's continue with them, that concern um, um, kind of the nature of what heritage speaker is. Uh, one is, how common is it for an American heritage learner with imperfect and limited Russian to sound like a native speaker who lives uh, in the homeland? Well, it depends on what you count as a native speaker, and it also depends on whether or not this person was um, 
exposed to any education in Russian um, as a grown up. So there are some people who are considered gifted learners and uh, they may have very um, strong set of errors in their grammar, but their pronunciation may be very good. Uh, so if you take people who haven't been schooled in Russian, let's say in high school or at the college level, you generally uh, see that they sound different from a native speaker, but there will be some outliers where people will say, oh, you know, he or she sounds almost like a native speaker. We, we did a study where we recorded such speakers um, who never went to any education in Russian. Record them for about 15 seconds and asked um, native speakers of Russian who were not linguists to listen to the 15 seconds of their speech and tell us if this person was uh, from the homeland or was a mm, heritage speaker. And we got about 90% accuracy. So they were able to separate homeland speakers from heritage speakers. So there's obviously something in their pronunciation uh, which may be very, very subtle, but it still tells them apart. Now, when they go to school, um, when they start relearning Russian as young adults or as grown-ups, there you have a question of motivation, exposure, the amount of input that they get, and in principle, you can bring them to the level which will be near native, almost native, and then, you know, if they go to the country, um, they will get even better. There is an, an enormous potential for improvement in those speakers. And let me ask you three more questions and then I will hold on the questions that concern morphology, mm -hmm. uh, error correction, okay. and motivation until later. And I promise people who ask those questions that I won't forget. Um, so um, the first of the three questions, they all have to do with definition of heritage speakers. Um, how do you identify the differences between heritage learners and bilingual speakers? And related to that, does first language affect the dominant language at all? Um, Is there any difference in the speed of speech of monolingual English speakers and heritage speakers of Russian or any systematic errors in English? Um, so when we, um, when we talk about bilingual, so it's important to remember that heritage speakers are bilinguals. They're just a type of bilinguals. So when you talk about bilinguals, a bilingual is someone who learned both of their languages before age five. And um, so you can have either simultaneous bilinguals, people who started learning both languages from zero, from birth, or uh, sequential bilinguals. And these are, used, these are people who get their second language around age three. Around age five or six, we start talking about early second language learning. They may be as good as um, bilinguals, but if you start probing their knowledge or if you subject them to various linguistic means, which you don't really do on a net daily basis, you can see the differences. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's in terms of the words we used, in terms of the classification. And then um, can you remind me of the second portion of the question? And the second one, yes. Does first language affect the dominant language at all? For instance, is there any difference in the speed of speech of monolingual English speakers and heritage speakers of Russian oh, or yes. any systematic errors in English? Uh, yeah, so um, we, uh, we do see, and in general, in this, this is a very interesting new area of research, but uh, there is more and more work showing that when you have a bilingual, both languages influence each other. So we do see some effect from Russian, however, uh, low proficient Russian on the English of heritage speakers. So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> in uh, modern American English, uh, there is such a phenomenon as unreleased stops. So if you have something like the word um, cob, C-O-B, uh, younger speakers of American English say something like cob. So B is almost imperceptible because they don't open their lips when they do it. It's called unreleased stops. That's a very common property. So if you just listen to uh, your students, you will hear it a lot. Heritage speakers, probably because they're so used to dealing with people who don't know English very well, uh, do not have that. So even if they speak perfect English, or it sounds like it's perfect English, we can measure and see that they have a much larger number of release stops. So they say cob as opposed to cob uh, in uh, their English. So that's just one example. Another example is that they differ from um, native speakers in the 
a rate of so-called disfluences, and that is how much do they pause between the subject and the verb. So for example, if we have something like, I know my dog ate my homework, a lot of speakers will pause between my dog and ate my homework. And that's a very common area in disfluences. We find that heritage speakers are better than monolinguals at that. So there are some areas, and at this point we're still probing where they are, but um, in general, it's a very good question. To generalize it, uh, we do find that um, it's not specific to Russian. So we don't find anything particular to Russian um, and not to, let's say, Mandarin or Korean that affects the English of our heritage speakers. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more. Um, I'll read it in Russian because it came in in Russian. Чуть раньше вы отметили особенности интонации. Скажите, есть ли какие-то специфические наблюдения на этот счет? Можно ли интонацию назвать в кавычках показателем потери или наращивания языка? So should I answer Russian or in English? Let's do English. Okay. So, uh, so the question is whether or not prosody can be treated as a uh, signal of baseline speakers, homeland speakers, and heritage speakers, and the answer is obviously yes. Um, despite the fact that we know that these groups differ, we don't quite know uh, how, because that's the least studied area of um, heritage research, and in general, people don't do a lot on prosody. So there are a couple of observations. People generally say that heritage speakers, as opposed to native speakers of Russian, have many more arises at the end of the sentence, and that makes them sound as if they're hesitating, like they're not certain of what they're saying. Uh, and uh, we also see a very similar kind of rise in the speech of first-generation immigrants, so it's not clear if this is something that just heritage speakers do or other speakers do as well. So <clears throat> I guess we can all tell that there is something. What I, I'm not prepared to say is what exactly the range of variation or the range of differences is, uh, but I think it might be a very good place to um, attract their attention to and indicate that they sometimes sound different from a native speaker. And again, I wouldn't, I would very much encourage people not to say you sound wrong, but you just sound different. Mm -hmm. And one more question before we continue. Um, are there any studies that classify heritage language writers? In other words, what characteristics of the written language correlate with levels? Um, I think that's probably a question for you, Irina. <laughs> I am not aware of any studies in terms of the level of heritage language writers. I know, um, I know that um, you know, we you know we can classify them into uh, writers and not writers, mm -hmm. uh, i.e., literate illiterate those who know the alphabet, those who don't know the alphabet. I know Ala um, Smyslova will be uh, talking uh, on March second when we do our webinar. Um, um, about how heritage speakers actually go about expressing uh, uh, Russian sounds and correct endings um, with using whatever they have, uh, an alphabet soup or using actually Latin letters uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to express that. Um, but we don't know in terms of proficiency other than actual proficiency writing, we don't know as far as I know uh, different levels for heritage language writers here. Um, I think it's a really good question and it's also, um, I'm very happy to hear it because to me it's a sign of maturity in the field because when we started working on all this, let's say about 20 years ago, there was so little work that um, the writing was the last problem that we had. So the first thing was basically to understand what these people are and where their problems may come from. So the fact that we're now in a position to address their writing shows that there has been a lot of work done. What I would like to emphasize is that it would be really important to conduct this kind of research and writing, not just in isolation or specific to Russian, but related to other heritage languages, because we know something about, I don't know, writing in Spanish, writing in heritage um, uh, Korean. Um, that would be a very useful area to look for lessons from. So people often say that it's harder for 
Russians to write because of a different alphabet, and it's harder for Russians to read because of a different alphabet. But um, here, that's, that's why I brought Spanish up. We see that even with heritage Spanish, where the alphabet is the same, there are tremendous problems writing and reading in that language. So it's not just about knowing the letters and knowing the alphabet. It's something else, and I will actually get to that in a couple of my slides down the road. Okay, so we can we can stop with questions now and let you continue. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, the myth of understanding. So we talked about how heritage speakers have systematic differences, and some of the questions that Irina read um, uh, mentioned that they speak incorrect. They don't speak incorrect. They speak different from what we speak, but their language is very coherent in terms of what they are doing. Now. Despite the fact that everybody notices that they make mistakes, that they speak different, uh, people also say that heritage speakers very, are very good at understanding. And they are indeed much better at understanding than second language learners, even if you match the proficiency. But it's important to keep in mind that our heritage speakers typically understand contextually established interaction, because they're learning the language at home, and so you know, as teenagers, they're pulling their roots. They don't want to talk to their family in any language. And so they will, you know, have minimal interactions. And the context will determine, you know, where the car keys are, uh, what time they have to be home, and so on. So when we uh, put their language to test, when they give them, when we give them ambiguity, or we give them cultural references, which they don't know, then we immediately see that they experience very ser serious difficulties. So the idea that they understand everything is incorrect. I'm going to show you an example from a study we did, which has to do with relative clauses, clauses like katori. So here's a picture where we can say, what sabaka katoru daganyayet koshka, or if we want to talk about the cat, what koshka katoraya daganyayet sabaku. Now you can see that for a Russian speaker, it's very easy because we know katoru katore. But um, notice that the endings are not stressed, so it's really hard to tell what we're saying. And our heritage speakers don't know cases. So if I ask a heritage speaker, где собака, которую догоняет кошка, and show them these two pictures, uh, what we find is that they will all try to use the bottom picture. They interpret the sentence as собака, которая догоняет кошку. So in other words, they're completely ignoring the endings on Katore and on Koshka, and they're just giving us the interpretation, which is grammatically privileged, because every time you have a relative clause, the privileged interpretation, you're talking about the subject. And if you look at Russian, um, this is related to the question that someone asked, um, whether or not children and heritage adults are different. What you see here is that um, native speaker children in red and heritage speaker children in green uh, do extremely well when they are shown two pictures and are asked to choose the right picture. So if they see those two dogs and cats, um, and they need to choose sabaka katoru yu daganyayet koshka, they do the right thing. Heritage monolingual adults are, of course, at ceiling as well. They do extremely well, but notice how poorly our heritage adults perform. So there is something that the children know that the adults don't know. And this is where we can see that there was a grammar, and this grammar was just not learned very well enough. So by the time they grow up and they're separated from the speech community, this grammar gets uh, reanalyzed and develops into a more general universal grammar. So we find the same pattern in heritage speakers of other languages, so something very similar is going on. And uh, it's important to show that relative clause grammar is native like in heritage children, but it undergoes real attrition in adult heritage speakers. So uh, that's an indicate, and that's just one little indication that um, they don't know everything. I'm not bringing up any cultural references, but I'm sure everybody in this audience has experienced situations where you tell a joke and then you spend half an hour explaining to the heritage speaker what the joke was about. Um, and that's, again, something that they can't understand because they don't have the cultural references or they don't understand wordplay. And that's one of the best way of teaching them because this is something that they enjoy and they seem to learn very, very nicely from them. Now, 
Uh, because we all have this perception that they speak wrong, they speak incorrectly, there is this idea that it would be useful to correct them. So the idea is if we get correct, if they get corrected on a regular basis, they will improve. And this is a very, very strong misconception. And the answer to the idea, should we correct them, is no. Uh, we know that in first language acquisition, correction is extremely um, unproductive, pretty much useless. Let me show you an example from an interaction between, between a child and a parent. So R stands for ребенок, M is mama. What идет дядя без велосипеда? Same mistake that we've seen before, без велосипеда. So the mom says, дядя без велосипеда. Uh, the child says, почему без велосипеда? Uh, the, the mom continues, she's very insistent, she's correcting. Uh, the child is also very insistent. So he says, почему он без велосипеда? The mom doesn't give up, she says, скажи без велосипеда. So the child just go, ignores that and says, почему он приходит в школу? And so that's a very typical pattern. We see that a lot in child language. Children do not learn from correction. And heritage speakers do not learn from correction. Moreover, corrections make heritage speakers feel extremely insecure in their less dominant language and their heritage language. And when they're insecure, they're reluctant to speak. And furthermore, correction focuses on what's called micro-learning, the learning at the word level or the grammar level, whereas heritage speakers seem to respond much better to macro-learning, the learning which involves literacy, which involves cultural references and other possibilities. So we looked at the idea that it's not a real language. I hope that that convinced you that it is, that they don't really forget everything and that they don't understand everything. So now let's look at this notion that they better stay speaking English. In other words, it's kind of useless to teach them Russian because we'll never get them to the level at which uh, they should be. So actually, maybe I could just go to that fourth myth and then take the questions. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, how can we help these people? How can we make them uh, less murderous with respect to the language of Pushkin? Um, and my two answers, which are very, very uh, preliminary, because I'm not an educator, I'm a, a linguist, and I'm of the type who likes heritage speakers where very, where, when they're very low proficiency. But my suggestion is, you can teach them about the difference between what they speak and uh, what the baseline or the homeland language is. And the second thing where you can really help them is giving them literacy. And by literacy, I don't mean just knowing the alphabet. I mean immersing them in the culture which is appropriate to their age. So let's go back to the English example I had with the hood and bonnet. Uh, who asked the question, which one is correct? The answer is both. How do we teach someone who doesn't know about the hood and bonnet that both are correct? By discussing the differences and by highlighting the simple fact that you say hood in the United States and bonnet in the United Kingdom and that you can easily manage both. So in other words, when you teach heritage speakers, it's not a zero sum game. You're just adding something to what they already know and you're creating two dialects of Russia in their head. Um, in terms of literacy development, uh, we know that they have vocabulary gaps, and we know that in general, learning to read expands the vocabulary. That's how people get more literate. Now, we also know, including some of the stuff I showed you today, that there is a correlation between the vocabulary you know and the grammar you know. And so expanding the vocabulary allows you to grow better grammar. And then finally, learning to read raises what's called metalinguistic awareness, which is essentially the ability to think about the language and to notice the small things which you haven't noticed before. So I've talked a lot about mythology, so now tell me, let me tell you a few truths, the things which I think are quite real. The first one is that if our speakers learn to read, they will speak better. And I don't mean reading just classical Russian literature. It's pretty hard to read uh, the 19th century literature, even for someone who is, I don't know, 20 years old in the homeland right now, because the language has changed so much. So it might be easier for them to read something which is not um, classical Russian literature, which is not what you find in like every textbook of Russian, because that's taking them 
to the language which is no longer used. But if they learn to read fairly modern contemporary language, they will speak better. And the more they realize um, how much they can do, the better they get. In other words, they need to be encouraged and not constantly told that they're doing things wrong. So let me talk about some psychological and psycholinguistic benefits of reading. Reading increases word knowledge. So the more you read, the more words you know. Word knowledge is correlated with grammatical ability, as I showed today. And uh, we know from the studies of reading of first language, monolingual speakers, that there are small but very highly reliable increments in word knowledge due to reading at all grade levels. So if you take a person in the kindergarten, if they read, they will have a better vocabulary. If you take a senior in high school, again, if they read certain material, their vocabulary will be better. Now, <clears throat> when uh, you read and uh, you encounter a new word and learn that word, um, that's a pretty good likelihood. The likelihood of learning an unfamiliar word while reading is about one in 20. So in other words, for every 20 words I encounter, I might find one word which, was going to be, which is going to be new. Finding that word doesn't necessarily mean that I will learn it, but at least there will be a chance that I will learn it. But if I see that same word three times, then the chances of learning it become much greater. Now, the likelihood of learning an unfamiliar word when children are reading easy narratives is one in 10. And that might seem paradoxical, but what's important is that when a person reads what's at their level, they don't spend all their effort on understanding every letter that they read. And they start looking at the macro level, at the level of the whole story, the level of a whole sentence or poem, and that will help them uh, learning to read. So not only do we need to give these people something to read, but we also need to give them something which is appropriate to their level of knowledge. And so if they, we see that their vocabulary is not great, you probably don't want to give them something complicated from, I don't know, Eugene Onegin or something like that. You need to start with a more accessible narrative or create one which they would really appreciate. So uh, uh, the ease of reading is important. And if our speakers are given the materials which are very hard for them, where they have to read every word and then look it up in the dictionary, that's a recipe for disaster because they will not be able to follow through. They wouldn't enjoy that. And you're not gonna get this likelihood of one in 10, which I showed on the previous slide. So it's better that heritage speakers be exposed to simple short narratives in the beginning, and then you can build on that or even have them build those narratives. So I'm gonna give you two examples. One is from my research and the other is from Irina's class at Brandeis. So one is called tapping. So uh, we'll, we'll do this little exercise together. So if I give you the Russian words, which you probably don't use a lot, skrepa and greksa, uh, you need to tap each time you hear a sound. So how many times are we gonna tap for skrepa? Six times, right? Okay. Um, and when you do this kind of tapping, you basically combine the uh, sounds of the words with the way those words are written. So what we see when we <clears throat> give this to heritage speakers is that they are unable to tap for sounds. You see a lot of very tall blue bars which show that they are just tapping twice for each of those words. So skrepa, greksa. So they tap for syllables. Because that's something that's very salient, that's something that children learn very early. And so for heritage speaker to distinguish six sounds in the word skrepa, despite the fact that they hear them and that they can produce this word, is very, very hard. And that accounts for the very low red uh, bars in this chart, which is where we're asking them to tap six times. Now, what we did, we took these people who did not have any exposure to Russian, uh, to Russian literacy, and we taught them to read, and we repeated the exercise uh, 
um, after two weeks. And what you see now is that they got the exercise perfect. So you have very tall red bars, which indicate that they're now tapping six times. They know what the sounds are. So they've learned this association between the writing and the sounds, and that has helped them in the tapping exercise. So it's a very simple exercise. And um, I was fortunate because I basically found a lot of heritage speakers who were, that's just another way of showing the same chart. So this is um, what they did with phonemes before and after. So here, look at the blue, you see that they did much better. So very simple um, effect of instruction for people who were never in a language class. So we just learned how to tap after we've learned some literacy. And now I want to go, uh, go, I want to discuss a more interesting case, the case that Irina pioneered, where she had her heritage speakers write in Russian for a whole semester. And so what you have here is my favorite text about the alligator, where uh, the person is just writing the way he hears everything. And there are a lot of calcs, one day in January. Uh, so there are a lot of spelling mistakes. Um, there are no punctuation signs. So clearly looks like what a child would write, despite the fact that as a student. But look at the results, which you see at the end of a semester, where the person is still making some minor stylistic mistakes. But over a course of a semester, when they were constantly encouraged to read and write, they actually did extremely well. And so that means that we can take these people back to Pushkin. And in order to do that, we just need to give them as much reading and literacy and as much instruction as possible. So uh, heritage speakers can uh, learn to speak the language which is close to the homeland language. And when they do that, we need to be their partners and not their adversaries in the process of learning or relearning. Um, so what I wanted to sort of say as a conclusion before I take other questions is that heritage languages are coherent systems which operate on their own principles. And we don't have this picture with ruins in the head, which is a collection of chunks. So this is wrong. What instead you have is a very nice, very uh, beautifully built architectural system which resembles, you know, a modern city. It's a grammar, but it's different from the baseline grammar. It's different from that grammar in a systematic rather than random way. My job as a linguist is to learn how it's different. And then someone could use my results and then look at how they can combine this grammar with the grammar of the baseline language. So heritage speakers are like happy families because they're all alike in some ways. And we see a lot of similarities across heritage languages, which reflects universal properties of human language. Um, whereas when we look at the differences from the homeland language, we also see some effects of language change. So I'll give you an example of Russian. So in Russian, in standard Russian, you're supposed to have uh, the famous genitive of negation. Uh, very few Russians do that these days. So they all say, um, instead of and our immigrant speakers don't make this distinction themselves. So that indicates that the genitive of negation in homeland Russian and in immigrant Russian is undergoing significant loss. So we can't expect our heritage speakers to know something that their parents are not using. And that's just an amplifying the fact that we often see effects of language change in the language of our heritage speakers. So back to our mythology, I hope I've shown you that all these issues are incorrect. And I wanna close um, with the idea that heritage speakers are actually a very eager audience, especially people who are in your language classes because they're well motivated and a self-selected group, they wanna be helped. If they didn't wanna be helped, they wouldn't be in the class. And that means we need to learn how to help them. And there are two ways to look at that, which I often notice. People are very, very happy when a second language learner does something right, even if it's something very minor. But at the very same time, uh, people are very happy to notice even small errors in the heritage language of heritage speakers. And I think 
we should change this glass of half glass is half empty mentality. And instead of getting fixated on the gaps in their knowledge, we should celebrate what they know and build on their existing knowledge. Because even a very, very weak heritage speaker has better potential than a very strong L2 learner. So thank you. And at this point, I'm happy to answer as many questions as I have answers for. And as we have time for. Okay. Um, we do have time. Um, we have 15 minutes at least. So um, I will not group the questions into thematic units. So let me just go through the questions that are outstanding at this point. Um, I have one more question about cases and that's from Isolda. Do you think that heritage speakers acquire cases the same way as monolinguals and later their language undergoes attrition? Or they do not acquire them completely, perhaps only a few functions of a certain case. Um, I think they just learn certain functions of a certain case because they use a lot of um, uh, analytical forms. So uh, we certainly don't expect them to know, uh, for example, every function of the instrumental. They might know that some very basic functions, but not everything. Mm -hmm. um, do these fabulous insights into reading for heritage learners translate, no pun intended, for our L2 learners? That's one out of 10 words. Um, the, uh, the studies that I showed you relate to monolinguals. So um, the observations are primarily based on children learning to read in their first and only language. And as, as usual, most of the literature is based on English. There's a little bit of literature on reading in French, some reading in German, but most of the studies uh, including the numbers that I showed you, are monolingually based. Uh, generally, for L2 learners, uh, there is a lot of variation depending on uh, the type of instruction, uh, whether it's immersion, whether it's uh, which way they were taught. I'm totally out of my depth there because I don't know much about L2 teaching, but uh, generally, it's probably not a good idea to take the reading uh, strategies from uh, monolinguals and heritages and translate them to L2s. Um, there's another question. How important is listening and watching films, animations compared to reading? Is reading more important? Um, I, I think that our heritage speakers generally like to think that their listening is very good. And when they see a video or they see an animation, uh, they are provided with additional context, which again helps them. So in a way, it's sort of uh, reinforcing what they already do fairly well. When they read or when they're put in an experimental setting like what we do, uh, you're challenging them a little more. So I think these are just two different things. So let's say if you have just an hour a week, I would probably spend it on reading. But if you have two hours, you could do both. So it's a question of how much time you can get their attention. Mm -hmm. And then there was a question from um, Amy Nine, who's asking, what is Greksam? And yeah. should we teach such rare words to the students? No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't um, and you shouldn't be doing what we do in experimental setting, because again, in experimental setting, what we do is uh, we try to give them a very, very complicated situation because we're essentially pushing them to the limits. So the metaphor I would use is the metaphor of running. So we all go jogging, but very few people can run um, at the Olympic level. So when people are tested for language comprehension in uh, linguistic experiments, that's essentially putting the language to the Olympic running test. But when they're in the classroom, you need to learn to teach them how to run comfortably. So I wouldn't do that. Now, Grexa is not a real word. It's a made-up word. And so Skrepa was a real word and Grexa was not. It was just a word which was made up using the properties of a Russian word so that our speakers could be challenged even more. Mm -hmm. um, there is a grammar question on verbs of motion. What sorts of issues do heritage learners have with verbs of motion? Do they use unidirectional and multidirectional relatively correctly? Or is this one of the most difficult areas? Um, that's a good question, but I think it's probably a question for you and uh, Evgeny, uh, because I don't teach them. And um, I don't think we ever tested, we tested verbs of motion with respect to aspect. 
Um, so it's not just, um, you know, yechel priyechel, but generally how well they do with perfective and imperfective. And what happens is that even very fluent heritage speakers of Russian um, do not uh, know all the usages of imperfective. So that might go back to the question Isolde was asking about cases. So, for example, it's very hard for them to understand uh, the question, ты ездил к дедушке? Because uh, they would be tempted to say, ты съездил к дедушке? The so-called general imperfective, where the aspectual uh, qualities of the event are not specified at all is very very hard for them and so that's all i can say from the research side but you know hopefully you both can add something about what they do I, yeah i can add a couple and and alicia um uh thank you uh is reminding that uh kira gore has an article on um uh, a study done on um uh, verbs of motion by heritage speakers Right, but um, her group was not clearly here. That she had a lot of people who were born in the in Russia. So uh, again, we're looking at sequential bilinguals, and uh, so I would be very careful with the data because um, uh, you, if you want to get real heritage speakers, you want the people who were born in this country who didn't live in Russia. My my uh, impression from working with them is that they the multidirectional they, they in comprehension when they insist uh, they they understand what I mean yezdil versus kadil but they really like pashol uh, mm -hmm. as the uh, round trip as 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 a word that expresses a round trip mm -hmm. um, uh, movement uh, either by foot or by conveyance so. Okay. Прошлом году мы пошли в Россию. That's okay. the uh, so I think there are sentence. two things here. One is this perfective and perfective difference. And as I said, we all know that they have trouble with generalized and perfective, like the uh, язык And then the other one is that in Russian, you have this difference between ехал, ходил, летал. The manner is expressed in the verb. Whereas in English, that's expressed separately. And this is something that they don't quite understand. And um, without having any experience teaching them, um, I can just say as a linguist that there are these two types of languages. One is called manner languages, where the manner of motion is expressed in the verb. And uh, past languages, where all you express is the direction of the motion. So it would be useful to talk about that, and then maybe ask them explicitly to compare English and Russian, because that might direct their attention to the differences. But I don't think that means they will start speaking right, but that gives us a little bit of a um, material to rely on in order to develop their metalinguistic awareness. Mm -hmm. there, there were a few questions about um, error correction. There was a question, and I'm trying to make a segue here. What error correction approach would be the most beneficial for this type of learners, in your opinion? Um, there was a participant who said, in my experience, many of the grammar challenges experienced by heritage speakers are easy to correct with focused grammar study and just learning the rules. Heritage speakers have an intuitive sense of the grammar concepts. They have just not had the education and have not had the experience of practicing correct Russian. So for them, learning the grammar is a much easier experience than it is for a non-heritage speaker. Um, I agree. I think uh, that they that's what we call metalinguistic awareness. Bilinguals generally have much better metalinguistic awareness and heritage speakers are bilingual. So it's much easier for them to think about the grammar because they're already comparing two languages implicitly and you're just waking up that uh, sleeping beast, which is there, which knows that they have to smell one language versus the other. But um, I would probably not call uh, the language they speak incorrect and then uh, talk about using the correct Russian. I would just say, you know, here is the diaspora Russian, here is the homeland Russian. So if you want to sound like a homeland speaker, this is what you do. So it would be really useful to avoid the terms correct and incorrect. Mm -hmm. And um, any more thoughts on what error correction approach would be the most beneficial for the uh, staff learners, in, in your opinion? I would probably give them <laughs> Exam. Uh, again, this is where I'm out of my depths. I've never had them in class. And I think I would have been a disaster in class. Uh, but um, 
my impression is you give them a couple of sentences, a couple of uh, examples where one has the um, standard way of speaking and the other one is something that they do a lot, like back to our example, без собачках, без велосипедах, and ask them to, to choose. And if they start choosing, or if, even if they start hesitating, this is the place where you can introduce the rule and then they can start talking about that rule. And as you do that repetitively, hopefully they will start avoiding that in production. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is more of a quest of a practical question for Irina and Evgeny. I don't know, what, what do you guys do? Yeah, um, actually, the way, since we do have Olga um, uh, Keegan talking on the 28th and then Ala and I uh, talking on the 2nd, we'll, we'll, for, for people who are wondering about pedagogical approaches and error correction, we'll go much more into detail uh, about this question. So I, I just pose this question to you, uh, Masha, as a researcher, obviously. Well, as, as a researcher, I'm all for um, sort of raising their metalinguistic awareness. And I had a student who wrote a senior thesis about developing uh, special linguistic exercises for heritage speakers of Spanish, uh, where the idea was, okay, well, let's compare different dialects of Spanish, let's compare different forms of politeness. And so she basically created those contexts similar to what I was just describing. And then people were encouraged to use them in the classroom. I haven't seen anything like that for Russian, but um, I think it would be a useful exercise. And um, mm -hmm. I think they would enjoy that because as the person who wrote the question said, they have this intuitive knowledge um, and they enjoy talking about their language because they feel a little bit more in control. And I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Couple more questions. We still have time for that. Going back to the reading question, how important is reading poetry versus the prose? It doesn't matter. What matters is how much language they get. So if they're reading poetry and they're getting pretty much the same words you want them to read from Denis Kinaraskaza, go for it. Um, I would not introduce old poetry because there will be a, lo a lot of difficulties with special vocabulary, additional comprehension issues, but I don't think there's any difference otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a related question to this, uh, although you, you, you already answered it, but I want to pose it again, um, uh, because maybe there's something else to be said uh, about it. So um, one of the participants is saying, I'm discussing Vishnyovi Sat with a bunch of heritage speakers now, the young adults. Um, they basically dislike it. They'd rather study the Pagadi. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. suggestions? Besides, you, you already did mention that 19th century literature is difficult for them. Um, anything well, else that would be I said? I don't know, but the Pagadi is kind of something that brings up their childhood or stuff like that. But I think, again, speaking out of my depth, I would probably work my way backwards. So first read Denis um, Kineraskazu. Uh, which might be a very good way of getting a lot of really good vocabulary and very easy grammar to them. And then, you know, after you've read that, uh, re read Zoshenka and then go to uh, Chekhov. Um, I also think that it's very hard to read plays. Um, I don't know if in this case they watched the play or they read it, but I remember when I was a high school student, we could read, to the, read those plays. It was boring like hell. And so I didn't enjoy it either. So maybe I'm sort of projecting my uh, memories from 30 years ago, but um, I would say use shorter genres and work, work your way backwards from like late 20th century to the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we covered, um, uh, we, we covered, all of the questions, let me check, there's one more that just came in. Uh, do we have a list of literature for students to read? Um, I suggest, if you don't mind, let's hold this question for uh, the next two webinars so we can discuss pedagogical approaches. Is that the, the list of literature for the heritage students or for the people in the webinar? Uh, for the heritage students. Oh, okay. Because. Um, I was going to say that if, if people are interested in reading about heritage and reading about heritage research, I would recommend the uh, website from the National Heritage Language Science Center at UCLA, where there are a lot of references. There are some good questionnaires. 
uh, very nice test. So there's a lot of work there, which you can just find online. Um, and there are questions, there are continued questions to be about textbooks and uh, pedagogical approaches, but uh, A, we are out of time, and B, it really would be better if you, and I hope you will be joining us for February 28th and March 2nd uh, webinars where we can uh, talk more specifically about uh, textbooks. There are some I can quickly um, mention right now that besides Russian for Russians, there is Uchimse uh, Pisat. Uh, also by Olga Kagan and um, Anna Kudima. Uh, there is Russian Without Borders, Ruski Bez Granits, which m mostly targeted at, at high school, um, uh, high school uh, heritage speakers of high school age. And, and there is um, a textbook that um, my colleague Alessia Kiselev and I are working on. So if you're interested, we can discuss that during the following seminars. Um, I want to finish to close uh, with uh, um, a comment from Lee Robbie, who says, um, I would say the glass is more than half full for heritage learners when we consider how long it takes for non-heritage students to even develop an intermediate level vocabulary necessary for communication in a language such as Russian. I think, I think that's an excellent comment and I couldn't agree more, but um, maybe uh, the tide has turned and my whole tirade about, you know, the glass being half full is outdated, which will make me very happy. But I'm so used to hearing that, you know, heritage speakers do this wrong and do that wrong and don't know this and don't know that, that I wanted to make a point that we should celebrate what they know and how creative they are. And um, if that's the consensus that you guys have, uh, that makes me extremely happy. Because even the people who I study who are usually at the very bottom of the proficiency level have some language which can be woken up with sufficient instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Masha, so much for the webinar. Uh, thank you to participants for all the questions, uh, for participation. We hope that you will join us again. Uh, for the next two webinars in the series and the recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be available on ACTR website. And happy Friday, happy weekend to everybody. And thank you very much for, um, for, for being such a good monitor. I don't know what the, the right word is for the person who runs the web, webinar. Um, the, boss, the boss of us. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye everybody.